and you're sitting on a whole bunch of inventory, which you're hoping you can sell. That is a recipe for disaster. Now, there's probably yeah. a whole bunch of people who could tell me, oh, you know, Aaron, this is like, we've had cases and this worked out perfectly. That's nice. I don't, I don't deal in those cases. I deal in <laughs> proper practicality. So the, yeah. so the number one lesson learned here is if you don't have the buyers lined up, yeah. be careful how much of the Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Most organizations focus on growing revenue. Sure, getting revenue is always the hardest part. But did you know that the increased time between earning revenue and collecting cash could result in giant write-offs impacting your growth? Also, how would you define the right customers to focus? Would it be based on revenue or their ability to pay? Having a cash flow mindset is critical for growth, especially for capital-intensive organizations such as manufacturing. In today's episode, we have our guest Aaron Spool from Aventus Advisory Group who describes what it means to have a cash flow mindset in the organization. He also touches on business drivers and why tax and accounting should not drive business decisions. Finally, he discusses many scenarios of cash and revenue misalignment and resulting implications because of this issue. Let me introduce Aaron to you. Aaron is a 20 plus year finance exec who has helped entrepreneurs and executives grow adopt and fix their companies through operational improvements and data-driven decisions. He has helped raise tens of millions of dollars for companies and guided eight figures exits. He is a partner at Aventus, an on-demand CFO, finance and accounting firm, as well as a CPA and CFA holder. He is a frequent writer for Forbes, CrossFit enthusiast, and a scout master for his children's scout troop. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, welcome to the show, Aaron. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Of course, my pleasure. Just to kick things off, do you want to start with your personal story and current focus, Aaron? Sure, absolutely. So I've always been, I guess, a combination of an entrepreneur and a finance person at heart and kind of melding the two together. Uh, as you know, think about the typical kid business that you ran from lemonade stand to selling kids candy, things like that, yeah. all the way through the childhood. You get all the way through, you know, getting into college, focused on, you know, finance and econ, came out and had a whole bunch of different roles in different size companies, accounting, finance and analysis, eventually business intelligence, where I dealt with big data and making you know, data-driven decisions. And then all the way that culminated in being CFO of small and mid-sized firms. And I guess the, the story that I like to say is I'm a very cash flow focused CFO. And and there's a and there's a huge reason for that. What do you do? You learn from pain. And one of the CFO gigs I was at, and actually it was my first major one. I was super excited to be it. And it was an industry that I really cared about. It's a combination of manufacturing and tech. Really, really cool. And we ended up right after I joined, I took over all the financial modeling. I started studying everything. They went on a hiring spree because they raised a whole bunch of money. And soon afterwards, through some analysis of mine, I remember, I can remember the day, I looked at our revenue. I looked at all of our cash collections. I said, oh my God, we've got four months left before we run out of money. <laughs> That's not and, a pretty situation to be, I guess. Oh no. And trust me, the board did, the board was like, what? Because every presentation <laughs> until here, and I remember that the CEO even said, it's like, you know, this is the first, like when I first put the model before he saw the results, this is the first like actually hardcore data-driven model we've ever had. I'm really excited to see the results because oh, wow. before it just was story. I'm like stories, <laughs> like stories might- Stories about like, cash? <laughs> yeah, it's like, you can't have stuff. Yeah, I have a story, exactly. It's like stories might make a great podcast, what we're doing here, but stories don't make the thing. And so what's really interesting about cash, and this is gonna, and I and I try to give everyone says like, there is no good reporting 
on a day-to-day -day basis about cash. There's not. And if you think about it from an accounting perspective, everyone's thinking about income statement, balance sheet. They're thinking about profitability, all important stuff. But think about this way. Does your, does your sales group care about cash? Maybe if they're comped on it, do, yeah. do you even know your cash? And no one's going to, and there's no easy way because you can look at a bank statement, but that's a point in time. But cash is especially for manufacturing firms. And that's where cash becomes incredibly important. So I, I'm happy to go. I know we're going to talk about that a lot, but that's that's my story and why I'm super focused on cash as a CFO. Okay, amazing. So I'm super excited to talk about cash as well, because cash is king, irrespective of whether you are a small organization or bigger organization. And as you correctly pointed out, for manufacturing companies that are so capital intensive, so for them, cash is definitely king. But before we get into cash, one question that we have for everyone who comes on the show is going to be the perspective on growth. So Aaron, in your opinion, what is growth? That's a great question. So I think real true growth is not incremental. You can eke out a 5% additional, you could call it growth, additional gains from anything. Yeah. But true growth is transformational, is something that doubling the size of your sales, yeah. you know, adding multiple different you know, new offerings, so I would say when you get to 50% or more increase, that in my mind is growth. And that increase better, gosh darn. And growth can be two ways. Growth could be my expenses have grown. <laughs> but yeah, 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 on, yeah, for sure. But on business growth, <laughs> but on business growth, we'll keep it there because that's, I think that's the essence of your question. Is something transformational. And when you say at least minimally, you're half as big as you were before. That in my mind is growth. Okay, amazing. So let's go back to your comment about the cash flow focused CFO. So obviously there are a lot of different CFOs and they all have their own leadership styles. They all have their own ways of managing things. So how does a cash flow focused CFO differ from the other CFO mindset that you may have seen in the industry, Aaron? Sure. So I would say that like, so while I'm cash flow focused, especially for manufacturing, a really versatile CFO wears multiple hats. There's thinking about, you know, your profitability, that side of the house, thinking about the capital side and where you're going to get your money, whether it is to maintain operations or to fund growth or to get a really good exit or new investors, but those are all different mindsets and they're really good mindsets and they have a point in time. The difference between all those mindsets and the cash flow mindset is cash flow is eternal. And when you take your eye off cash and which, and really, if you think about cash is the essence of what you're doing, yeah, whatever yeah. you're doing in your business, eventually it's to get paid. And if you don't not just have enough money because cash is the fuel of business. Yeah. So not only do you have to have enough cash to fuel it, eventually you have to have enough cash to pay yourself. And I don't want to sound like they, you know, you're not in business to be a charity, but in the end, like, what's the point of all this stuff? The point is eventually you, you, to get paid yeah. and you, you pay yourself in cash. You can't, uh, and you might pay yourself in something else, but I'll tell you this, your energy bill is not paid in anything but cash. Your mortgage is not paid with anything but cash. Your yeah, kid's yeah. college tuition is not paid with anything but cash. Yeah. So I go back to cash is the fundamental unit, the fundamental substance, whatever fancy word or in, in, in small word you want to use of what what's going on. It's the fuel for your business life. Okay, so let's go back to your uh, comment about, or maybe just compare the revenue versus cash, right? So majority of the time, organizations are going to be very revenue focused. Yes, they are cash focused as well, but not as much, right? Their assumption always is if they are doing well in terms of revenue, then maybe they're cash problems are not going to be as big. So in your experience, have you seen any stories where everything was going well from the revenue perspective, but they ran into real business troubles because of cash management? Sure. There's two stories with this. Okay. And one is a general story and the other one is significantly manufacturing focused. Okay. So the classic case, and I've seen this and this is going to be so many companies I work with, they have great sales, which shows ever-growing revenue and really doesn't matter the business. And they don't realize that they haven't collected. Then they start investing more into this business. Yeah. And they start they and investing more could just be resources put. It could be inventory put, which we'll get into a little bit later, but they haven't collected. And if there's enough time that passes between sales and collections, yeah. you start to eventually have the come to your deity talk about it. It's a giant write-off. So write-off means, okay, we're not going to collect this. Yeah. And what I've seen is I've seen, especially repeatedly, I'll say this, the, the, the company I told you about, you know, my first story about cash, we assumed that we were going to have a lot of sales. We started getting a lot of sales, but collections weren't necessarily there. 
And it's what you find is that who's tied to the sale, almost always not the person that's tied to the collection. And not everyone wants you to harass the person that owes you money because they want to continue the business. But I always like to say the following. It's that sale isn't real and that relationship isn't real unless they're actually paying you. Yep. Yep. I agree. So that, that's, that's, that's high level. Now let's get into specifics. Right. So what makes manufacturing different than your, your traditional services business or your point of sale business is that it has two interesting things aligned with capital that make it so much more capital, uh, capital, I mean, capital, I mean, cash, cash intensive. The first is odds are you're going to have machinery, which costs a heck of a lot of uh, purchase to yep. lease, to finance, whatever word you want to use. Lots yep. of, lots of money, how you get that money, an entirely different conversation. The second thing, and this is the operational piece, is that odds are you have to buy something, put money down, and it, it, this is your inventory, right? You might even have to do something to that inventory, and that's the work in progress. You have to change it. This all costs even more money before you can actually sell it. So it's not like a sale that you already have the services or you have the technology because a technology company, oh, there's no like inventory of the amount of program that you're selling because it's digital. It's, there's unlimited supply. This is something very specific. You're selling, a, and I'll give you an example of clothing manufacturer. So where, and you said exactly a specific question and story of like where cash flow kind of got in the way of sales. So I knew a company that actually brought us on. They were expecting a huge amount. They were predicting a huge amount of sales. So they made a deal overseas to buy a whole bunch of clothing product. Then came time to pay the bill for the clothing product and they didn't have all the money up front. And so they wanted to be able to, find it something either through extra investment dollars or for financing. And I, and it wasn't a case where they had pre-sales. So they were just assuming they were going to be able to sell this entire product. And they were panicking because now they had this big invoice due. They weren't going to get the, they weren't going to get the product shipped so they could actually sell it until they could pay for it. And they didn't necessarily have the buyers in order to purchase it. So it became a really difficult financing decision. Yep. And we were able to get them financing because they had a really good rep. And, and the financing was based off of, this is asset-based finance. It was based off the inventory. So there's something there. They were able to finance it. They financed it. And the interesting thing was they didn't learn their lesson. Because they tried to do the exact same thing six months later, the, the people that we gave them for financing, and they, the three people were like, no, it's like you you have to be smarter than this. You can't you can't just assume. And this is where the cash flow thing comes. You don't have any money in the bank to be able to afford this purchase, and you don't have the other side is you don't have pre sales lined up. So why are you buying such a giant amount of inventory in bulk with the hope that you can sell it? And that's where the cash flow thing came in. Is is that you're sitting on a whole bunch of inventory, so it's it's you're using cash, a vital piece of fuel, and you're sitting on a whole bunch of inventory which you're hoping you can sell. That is a recipe for disaster. Now there's probably yeah. a whole bunch of people who could tell me, oh, you know, Aaron, this is like we've had cases and this worked out perfectly. That's nice. I don't I don't deal in those cases. I deal in <laughs> proper practicality. So the, yeah. so the number one lesson learned here is if you don't have the buyers lined up, yeah. be careful how much inventory you're holding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you don't have, there's a, and there is a medley way beyond this podcast, way beyond this discussion. There's a medley of ways in which you can finance inventory so you can get just in time inventory. Yes, you'll lose yep. a little bit of margin, but the yep. security of knowing that you're not going to be sitting on stale inventory or you're not going to be, you know, so out and owing people money is worth it every day of the week. Yeah. And you had the second story as well, or did you already cover that story? No, that was the, that was the first one. So I'll talk about a second story. And this is, and this is kind of, and it's, and you see this more with personal owners. So they're personal. So what I mean by that is a, and it doesn't have to be you know, people in they call you the founder owned or whoever says this is, it's one person that owns the company. So we have had a lot of guests. They actually call lifestyle business, the term. Yes. That they use yeah, lifestyle. lifestyle yeah, exactly. <laughs> you said it not be, but yes, it's a lifestyle business. Some <laughs> so what I find with a decent amount of lifestyle businesses is that they are going to mix their personal finances and their business yep. finances. And yep. this is an utter recipe for disaster. So just for yep. emphasis, Sam, I'm going to say it again. Mixing your personal and business finances is a <laughs> recipe for utter disaster. If this, if this is transcribed, bold it and underline. Recipe for utter disaster. And, 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 and let me walk through why. And this this is very, very pertinent. Personal finances. The number one thing you're thinking of most likely is I don't want to pay a lot in taxes. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do legally, right? So legally, right? Legally, not, yeah, to, yeah. not to pay taxes. Yeah. And usually that's spending money. 
Yeah. And I've seen manufacturing especially say, oh, I've got this lump of cash I don't want to pay taxes on. I'm going to buy more equipment and then yep. I'm going to be able to depreciate that and accelerate depreciate that. Okay. Well, you end up showing, you know, next to no profit or no profit. Therefore, yeah, you don't have to pay taxes and, or you bought a building or whatever it is. You buy these physical assets. That's fine in the short term because you don't pay taxes if that's your goal. And now you have this new piece of equipment that hopefully you can use to make more money off of. But the cost is that you're not bankable anymore. Because if I looked at your income statement and your balance sheet and as a credit issuer, as a credit committee in a bank looking to see if I'm willing to loan you money. So you haven't made a profit in three years. And I might say, oh, you have all this excess and it's probably not inventory you're sitting on because that's that's going to that's gonna handle you. You're sitting on all this equipment. And then you look at the various different ratios. Your return on net assets is super low. You have this revenue, but you have all these additional manufacturing assets. You're not even running efficiently. And so let's just, this would might, so I don't want to timestamp this, time stamp this podcast because kind of want this thing to be eternal but let's just say there's <laughs> let's just say hint hint there was a global pandemic yeah. and you're a manufacturer and you're desperately looking for uh, sources of capital well all those little fun things you did to uh, prevent yourself from paying taxes suddenly comes to bite you in the proverbial butt because you're not bankable yeah and so that's where I would say from a cash flow perspective, if you're personally, don't combine your personal and your business finances. There are ways to you know, minimize a tax bill, but I go back to the fundamental principle of accounting and finance when it comes to business is don't let the accounting, and that also means the tax paying, lead the business decision. Yeah. Business decision needs to be led about things like profitability, cash. Yeah market share, pleasing the customer, all yep. those things. That Those are business decisions. But what is the accounting going to make this look like from my revenue reporting? What is the accounting going to make this look like from my tax reporting? Can be a consideration, and it should be, but it should never be the top consideration because you'll get into situations like this that you're making suboptimal long-term or even short-term business decisions just to have good accounting. And this the secret is, it's like, okay, you made these accounting adjustments. Well, if someone's a sophisticated investor, they know what you did. They can figure it out. They're just going to yep. unadjust everything you did. And so they're going to see what you're, you're really looking like as a business. Yeah. Interesting. And now we are going to dig a little deeper into the misalignment of revenue and cash. So obviously, if it is actually misaligned, that's a real problem. But we have seen cases where it could look pretty just because the way it is recorded and reported. So we were talking about a scenario yesterday related to tailspin. And I don't know if you are familiar with a term called tailspin. It's typically the 80-20 rule in the procurement community. And it is called the expenses that don't really matter and people don't care for it. Right. So that's going to be your supplies, the marketing expenses, petty expenses that, that we are talking about from the procurement perspective. And there was a story in one case, they had the expectation or the assumption that they had the chill spent of 200K. But then they started figuring out in the accounting, okay, what just because their systems were not really integrated, they were relying on accounting to provide the information. And there was a big disconnect overall in the operations and finance. And because of that, finally, when they started digging, they found out that the actual tail spend for them was $5 million, okay? So this situation could very well happen in case of manufacturing scenario where you have your revenue and cash look perfectly aligned, but maybe they are not aligned. So that is number one problem. And number two, one scenario I see a lot more commonly, especially in the lifestyle manufacturing businesses, they don't even track product costs. And product cost could be so important. You really need to track your, you know, how much machine you're consuming towards the product. And that product costing could be very, very important because it provides great insight in terms of your profitability, which products are profitable, which products are not. So from the cash perspective, Aaron, when you look at this situation, when let's say the product is not getting costed appropriately, it's not getting reported appropriately, let's say from the production floor. How would you see this from the cash perspective? So there's going to be a couple of things. You talked about actually two different things, what I would call unrecorded liabilities. That's the technical yep. accounting term. Yeah. And the second is product profitability. You could also call it customer profitability. You could call it job costing. The most essential 
duty of the people running your plant besides actually running the plant and making it. So the number two duty, number one duty is make a good product as safely as possible, as efficiently as possible. The second is to actually record everything that went into it. So if you're not able to tie the inventory to the product to the sale, and you're not able to tie when you say the shipping cost to the product to the sale, and you're not able to tie the labor to the product to the sale, you will inevitably make poor decisions. You could have, and you're not going to see that from an overarching. So you say, so what I could do is let's just take a sample. So, all right, so I'm going to see my PL. And it shows that I'm profitable. But if you had two products, the classic case, two or three products, and one was the majority of the profitability and the other two were actually unprofitable, you got to ask yourself, why do you carry those other two products? Now, there could be a whole bunch of strategic reasons. Let's just assume that they're not. Let's just assume that you didn't know that they were unprofitable. And if you could could change those resources over, that'd be great. Or you could do something from staffing or manufacturing, whatever, to make them profitable. So if, if you can't break your profitability into both customer job and uh, product depending upon the type of the type of uh, products that you sell and how your business is run you're missing out and odds are you're making a lot of poor decisions where that comes to cash is a couple of things one you're pricing so you could be selling something at a price and even collecting it and the cash is totally fine but guess what that cash coming in is less than the cash going out yeah. that's the classic case of everything you talked about with job costing that's really where it is But let's talk about the other thing, because this is a lot of practicality that happens. And I call it unrecorded liability. So liability is is money that you owe, something that you owe therefore you're liable for. Don't bang me up on the accounting terminology here. Yeah. So a lot of times what will happen will be is that you've got the classic cases way before things ever got digitized, who's sitting on invoices, who's sitting on requests, who's sitting on bills, and they just put it in their desk drawer and they forget about it. You've incurred all these expenses, you owe this, but no one ever recorded it. So you don't even know that it's due. And then one day the power goes out or one day the service stops. And like, yeah. well, why, why did the service stop? <laughs> why did I, why did I, why are you repossessing my machine? Oh, well, you didn't pay your bill. What bill? What are you talking about? Now, it's easy if it's like the power bill, right? It's coming monthly. Yep. You're kind of used to that. There's ways to figure that out. But if you enter into a long-term contract or something that requires like installments and those installments aren't monthly, you could easily forget about it if it's not properly recorded. And that, and just, and that, that's part one. So to be aware of that, what you're really supposed to be seeing is like money out the door should be recorded on your liability side. Things that you owe should be there. What you're not going to get, and here's the interesting thing, what you're not going to get from your financial statements is when is it due? And that goes all into cash flow, uh, cash flow management. And there's no standard accounting report. And there's probably no standard, and people say that they have this stuff, but I haven't really seen it well, standard reporting package that's easily going to show you when all your cash flow in and your cash flow out is coming. That usually has to be done customized. And it should be the most important thing that you focus on from a tactical perspective is your cash flow in and your cash flow out. And if you, as I go back to like, you should, so how do you catch this stuff is, one, who's allowed to give to sign contracts? Yeah. It should be very few people in your company. Very few people should have the authority to do that. And then once you sign a contract and what's due, you better have a really, that has to be written down. It's not just written down, it's recorded somewhere in the reporting tools that you use. And the finance team, whoever it is, should have that recorded and it should be front and center. And it should be all part of your cash flow forecast. If it's not, make it happen. That is key because you're going to know your classic, oh, I have payroll that's due twice a month. I've got my rent and my power, all that stuff. You know that, but you're talking about the tail end spend. Really what you're talking about here are unrecorded liabilities. These are expenses that either are not reoccurring or not normal. I was just saying, I just say not normal, they're not reoccurring. And they should also never surprise you because you've agreed to them. Where it gets a little bit more complicated is if you have a service agreement and based off a of level of usage, it suddenly spikes. Well, that gets into more sophisticated. Who's managing level of usage? Yeah. And that could be anything, but let's make it super, super simple. Overtime. Are you managing overtime properly? And there's there's a whole bunch of philosophies why and the like, but overtime is the classic case of an unexpected cost. If right. you have an, a factory floor that, or you don't have the right staff, or you have you have surge sales and the like, it, it can, you could easily get into a place where you're spending a ton of dollars in overtime. And if you don't have a pricing mechanism in order to pass that on to your customer, you are going to incur a lot of cash flow pain. 
Yeah, so obviously the point that you made, that makes sense. See, that's slightly more black and white. But the scenario that I was talking about is not necessarily because of the unrecorded liability. It's slightly different, okay? So it's because of the operational and financial disconnect. Just because the finance is not going to have as much understanding of the operation and operation is not going to have as much understanding of the finance. So here in the scenario, what is ha happening is these expenses are being recorded, but they are being recorded differently. Okay, they are not being recorded in the right category on the PL the way they should have been recorded, right? So that's where the disconnect is. So that actually affects the product cost. And in my opinion, that should affect the cash as well. So do you agree that this is different or do you uh, still think that this is going to be a recorded liability? Oh, it depends, right? So it depends upon what. So if they're recorded as an expense, they've got to get paid, right? So from a cash flow perspective, you're high, high, high level. If it's a technology expense and I suddenly recorded it as rent expense. All right. Yeah, that's 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 bad from yeah. an <laughs> understanding perspective. But I mean, it's typically not as black and white, right? I mean, it's, it's no, no, it's, no. So let's, let's call it what you, So I think what you're really talking about, and I could be wrong here, is gross margin, right? Versus net margin. Because you said something very interesting. You said it, it should have been part of the job and it wasn't recorded. It was recorded elsewhere. Right. So there are many different scenarios, right? So I have seen where they what they would do as, as opposed to doing the real product costing, what companies do is they are recording the material for each of the job and they are recording, let's say, labor and equipment usage for each of the job. Rather than doing that, what they would do is, let's say, if you have the equipment and let's say if you're running 5,000 jobs, they'll simply divide by 5,000 5, and they'll record against those, right? So that's not actually the true cost. Sometimes it could be negligible, but sometimes it could be significant. So you're talking about, so yeah, so there's, you're allocating out a cost. You're doing cost allocations there. So you're, you're, there's a couple of different themes here. Right. Yeah. One is cost allocation. So what can two, I would say, so it's what you're really trying to do, right? The essence of what you're trying to do is how much does a job cost? Exactly. That's what you're asking yourself. Now, yeah. odds are you don't have a way to get people to record their exact time to the exact job. Because, yeah. and so if that's the case, okay, then. then you have to come up with an estimating structure. So I like to say the following. Cost allocations, the purpose of a cost allocation is to influence behavior. Where the classic case where it makes, in my mind, next to no sense is if you take a department and you say, oh, I've got a piece of real estate. All right, so I got to allocate rent. So I'm going to allocate rent out of maybe headcount. So yeah. based off the number of heads that you have, that's how much your department is going to pay for the rent. Uh, is going to... In my mind, that makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. Part yeah. one is that none of these people have any say into what rent is they're not negotiating leases right yeah. two they're going to be then incentivized to be very careful with their head count well they might be like hey hey great you know, have we're gonna make sure that they don't have high head count wonderful no high head count that's wonderful until that's a position that's desperately needed and so taking that aside it says you gotta be careful with the allocation so you only need to be concerned with allocation of specific costs that are directly related that these people have. So you do have yeah. power over the machine usage and you definitely don't want to, what I call peanut butter things. That's the worst thing to do. And peanut yeah. buttering is you just exactly said, we just head count. We're just going to spread it over by revenue, <laughs> spread it over by general expenses. <laughs> Pe peanut butter is a great condiment. Peanut butter makes a great sandwich. Peanut butter is bad for finance. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's another tag like it is. All right. So no, no the peanut butter effect is very, very bad. What you want to be able to do. And there's a whole bunch of ways to do this is like, where you can apply talking about allocation of costs so where you could it's, you can apply and if it's people if it's people on the floor the closer you can get to the action of what the people did and then be able to so to, to, to allocate the cost the better you are uh you might not be able to do it on a per hour basis or maybe they're doing five jobs at once and you know they're and it's by seconds so that allocation yeah. doesn't make as much sense yeah yeah I, I go back to practicality. Know what's happening on your factory floor. Look at the processes that are going, right? Make a rational, then a judgment of what these people are doing and then out and then allocate out accordingly. Uh, and you also then have to ask yourself when you're done with all this stuff, does it actually make sense? Do the numbers make sense? Because that's what a lot of people don't think of. And then they make some really yeah. bad decisions because the allocation model says X, but if, you're, if your intuition is different, yeah, it, the, the model still has to make sense. If I make a the old case, I make a financial model and it says we should do uh, X decision, and that decision you know is the dumbest thing in the world because the, the no one's ever going to buy it. Then there's something wrong with the model. Yeah, yeah. 
go back to does this stuff make sense? And the, the practical case is, so if, you, if you're running something on the factory floor, see how many runs you're doing, see how many people are there, see the, see and, the, and, and, and see if there's is parallel processing, is two machines being used at the same time, and it's the same person watching both machines. Well, okay, but you have to know that before you make an allocation decision. Yeah, amazing. So that's it for today. And do you have any last minute closing thoughts by any chance? Sure, I, I, I'll give you this. If you can't figure out what you're paying for something in total, and you can't figure out how much money in the end of the day you made off of something, you got a problem. So always look at your business transactions and especially every sale that you make as to how much money I'm making off of this. And if you actually really look at it, every expense that you have, how much money am I making off that expense? And the, uh, if the answer is not much, you don't have to stop the expense, but it just gives you a different perspective of why you're incurring that expense. And that's it. Okay, love it. So my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be, in my mind, everybody in the organization should be cash focused as opposed to just the CFO. And if you can have that mindset of being cash driven, because revenue is not only the earned, it has to be collected. Collection yes. is equally important. So on that note, Aaron, I want to thank you for your time. This has been very insightful and fun conversation. Wonderful. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Aaron or Aventus Advisory Group, head over to AventusAG.com. It's E-V-E-N-T-U-S-A-G.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Brian Goffenberg from Vital Hub, who discusses the difference between accounting for a public and private company. Also, the interview with Jim Gitney from Group 50, who shares his thoughts on each inflection point for companies and what they need to know to identify them and move to the next by making necessary changes. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get out. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.